Hello, everyone. It is Corey Booker, and I am so excited uh, to be having this panel on narrowing the wealth gap with baby bonds. I have an extraordinarily exciting panel. This is one of those panels that if I was just getting a chance to have an evening cocktail, not that I drink, but I'm maybe a mocktail is maybe a better way of putting it, uh, and just wanted to chill out in my living room, uh, these are people I would want to be relaxing with having really good conversation. And I'll add to that. This was actually billed. We billed it to them as a couch conversation. So I'm literally sitting here on a couch, relaxing, and I'm going to be able to look through the screen and have this conversation. Now, look, wealth shapes our country. It shapes opportunity. And the extreme wealth inequalities in the United States are really undermining the very values we speak to about having equal opportunity, liberty, and justice for all. Wealth is primarily passed down from one generation to the next, and our history and our laws deepened rather than shrunk a wealth inequality in our country in a significant way. Subsidizing now, like we do with hundreds of billions of dollars annually through things like our tax code, we subsidize the richest households uh, to double, help them to increase wealth. We uh, have seen in our past overtly racist federal policy, uh, which has also increased wealth disparities, uh, and really has just made the extraordinary wealth gap in our country even more uh, uh, solidified, especially because of those overtly racist laws solidified uh, by race. Just think, for example, about the, the richest 400 wealthiest Americans, according to the Forbes 400, the richest 400 Americans hold more wealth than all Black families in America combined. And so our panel today is going to discuss this issue of the deep wealth gap in America, how it hurts all of America. And we're going to focus on baby bonds, which I think is perhaps one of the, most, uh, one of the more transformational interventions that policymakers can do to close the racial wealth gap in this country. One day, I believe we will emerge, one day soon, I pray, from the darkness of the coronavirus. And when we do, we must put forward a bold vision for racial equality and racial equity in this country. Now, I see baby bonds as one critical piece of that, but clearly we have a large field of work to do. So I am excited and I wanna very briefly, very briefly introduce our panelists. Coming on in a few moments and joining the couch conversation will be Derek Hamilton. He is the incoming Harry, Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy at the New School. I am excited that Diane Stewart has joined us as well. She is the Associate Professor of Religion and African American Studies at Emory University. And Kilolo, uh, uh, and I'm gonna make sure I got this right, KJ Kazi, uh, she is the Institute Fellow at the Urban Institute, which is a, the Urban Institute I've relied on, leaned on so, so much. And I'm so excited that Kilolo is here as well. And so now I'm going to open it up to the couch conversation. And I'm going to start with the incredible uh, Kilolo by just helping people to maybe better discuss uh, and understand uh, the racial wealth gap in our country, which we know is as wide as it's ever been. In fact, after years of it closing during my lifetime, about 50 years old, uh, by the time the 2009 recession hit, it, 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 it exploded back, has not healed back to before I was born. Uh, that's how wide it is. And so maybe you can help give some folks better sort of language and understanding about the racial wealth gap. What do we mean when we talk about it? And, and again, uh, uh, how's it changed over time, maybe with more specifics? Great, so thank you so much. Um, I will just start with, with wealth to make sure everybody is on the same page. Wealth is simply what you own minus what you owe. And wealth allows families to address emergencies uh, like a, a car repair or to carry folks through hard times like when they lose their job or when there's a medical expense, like during this pandemic. But it also allows families to invest in higher education for the, themselves or their children, or to uh, buy a home or start a business. 
Now, the racial wealth gap is simply the difference in wealth or net worth between uh, white families and families of color. And in 2016, the wealth gap was for white families, um, it, white families had 10 times the wealth of black families and about eight times the wealth of Latino families. And this gap has grown over time. In 1963, white families had over 45,000 more in wealth than families of color. And at the median, that's at the median. By 2016, this gap had grown to over 150,000. This gap in the dollar amount of wealth also grows with age. White families accumulate more wealth over their lifetimes than African American and or Latino families. White households uh, white household heads in their 30s have a median wealth of about $87,000 more than African Americans. By the time that they are in their 70s, white household heads have a median wealth of about $271,000 more than African American family household heads. Well, I, I, you know, I, I want to just drive the point home a little bit more because often people focus on what you earn, what the paycheck you get is. But we see situations where earning may be similar between black, a black person and a white person, but wealth is still so dramatically different. Can you highlight a little bit of that for me? Absolutely. What we know is that even high earning African Americans have relatively low wealth. Um, and to make the point even sharper, um, African Americans with graduate degrees have less wealth than white, uh, white people who have high school diplomas. And that's, that's just stunning. And, and I know we're going to get into this a little bit more, but before I shift over to Diane, why? Why, why is this a situation where you see people who have done everything right, you know, gone to graduate high school, gone on to college, gotten graduate degrees, but yet are still so far behind um, other uh, families in the majority. What, what are some of the reasons for this? So this is important. We need to correct the myth. And the myth is that there are deficits in uh, families of color, in, in individuals who um, uh, are either members of African American, Latino, Native American, Indigenous American households, but they've done something wrong or haven't done enough in order to accumulate wealth. Um, and that's just simply not the case. The reason for the, the wealth gap is structural racism. And by that, I mean the policies, programs, and institutional practices that facilitate the accumulation of wealth by white families while creating barriers to and stripping wealth from families of color. And so to give, to give some examples, we can start with, you know, 1619 and the, the human trafficking of people of African descent to create wealth for white people while robbing people of African descent of the, the wealth of their own labor. This, this was perpetuated even after emancipation through black codes and, and Jim Crow laws, and then continued after that through um, federal policies and regulations that created um, racial covenants that prevented people of color from buying white, white owned homes through redlining that prevented investment, financial investment in black neighborhoods, all the way up to um, modern day, current day, um, targeting of subprime loans to communities of color, even when they qualified for prime loans, stripping them of wealth that they accumulated, even in the face of all of these policy uh, barriers. And, and that's the thing that I, I think a lot of us don't understand fully, is the degree to which uh, a wealth, in accordance to race, was uh, denied African Americans options and avenues from even the design of Social Security, which gave a lot of wealth security, was designed in a way to exclude professions that Blacks 
were dominating at the time. The GI Bill, which helped a lot of people uh, uh, who had no shot at college, but suddenly get extraordinary opportunities, those avenues were limited for African Americans. The land grants that were done that gave a lot of immigrant families coming from Europe their chance. I, I remember going through the Midwest and seeing families proudly put the deeds to their property up from the 1800s, original land grants, people who settled the land, uh, tamed it, brought it into farming, created generational wealth. About 20% of Americans can trace uh, their family history and even family wealth back to those original land grants. But Blacks were whole scale excluded from the land grants in the West. And so I could go through this, uh, in fact, entire books have been written just documenting all the ways that Black families were excluded from wealth. Frankly, all the way into the 1970s, the laws were overtly racist on many parts, were, were, were excluding African Americans. I tell my family story of even in 1969, my parents just trying to buy a home in uh, areas with the highest ranked public schools and houses that would increase in value, had to get a white couple to pose as them in order to buy their home. And so that's really powerful, uh, what you're saying. And maybe, Diane, if I can go to you, um, you've done a lot of this documentation uh, on how these policy decisions, not just at the federal level, but the local and state level, have really co contributed to this wealth gap. Could you maybe give a, us even a little bit more uh, on, on this picture for people to understand? Sure. Thank you, Senator Booker, for inviting me to this panel. Well, I, I entered the discussion on baby bonds through studying the state of love, marriage, and family formation for Black women. The last census revealed that 70% of Black women are unmarried relative to 45% of white women and 52% of other women. And I'm interested in Black women's opportunities for pro-social love and relationships, including marriages, because there are millions of Black women who want to be married and currently have no prospects for experiencing this rite of passage and its material and immaterial assets. So I address the problems that Black couples face with wealth building due to the long legacy of Black wealth deprivation in America, many of the kinds of practices and traditions that um, uh, Professor Kijikazi cited, just talked about. In my forthcoming book, I take a sweeping historical look at the structural forces, the institutions, policies, and cultural practices that have made healthy, love and marriage difficult, delayed, or impossible for far too many Black women in America. And examples abound. From the period of slavery when Black relationships were often disrupted through rape, reproductive violence, and domestic slave trading, to the post-emancipation period where Black widows of Civil War veterans were denied pension benefits at much higher rates than white women. In some studies, we're looking at the denial of benefits for black women at 40% relative to 16% for white women widows. So in 1881, the government actually devised specific guidelines for scrutinizing the pension petitions of black widows. And even went as far as instructing its agents to visit black families and examine the complexions of all children claimed by the petitioner. The thinking was that if the complexion of the mother differed from the complexion of the child, it was a strong indication that the claim of parentage was fraudulently submitted to secure greater financial benefits from the US government. And so the implementation of pension policies as they impacted Black women was a grand rehearsal for the way the government would treat poor Black women welfare recipients and their husbands or children's fathers during the 1950s, 60s, and after, often giving inadequate allotments to Black women and their children with one hand and removing other monetary sources from the family with another by garnishing the wages of the fathers of their children. Of course, mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex has depleted the finances of thousands of Black families and removed millions of Black men from the Black marriage market. So there is much to say about the history of how Black, what I call wealthlessness, Black wealthlessness and, and, and inherited poverty 
undermines uh, the, the possibility for healthy, sustained Black love, coupling, and marriage, which we know is a benefit to um, local communities and to the nation at large. First of all, that's powerful. Um, let me just say, uh, Karen, I, I know it's Professor uh, uh, and, and Senator, uh, but I know Professor Kijikazi would, would not mind if you called her uh, 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 and please call me Corey, because if we're hanging out on my couch, you got you to call me Corey, please, okay? And your book, what's the name of your book? Because I want people to read this book. Black Women, Black Love, America's War on African American Marriage. Powerful, 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 powerful. And so let, let, I want to pick up on one thread because people, again, these were not just laws uh, uh, as Kilolo and I were talking about that happened in the past. We now know that for, let's just say, drug crimes, there's no difference between blacks and whites for using drugs or selling drugs, none. But blacks are almost four times more likely to be arrested for those, to get felony convictions for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing. The, the, before, the two presidents before Donald Trump admitted to doing felony drug crimes, not just some marijuana. Um, but now you have, there's an economic impact on the family, correct? Could you maybe expand upon that? Because people don't understand the over-incarceration of entire communities, what that has done devastatingly to Black wealth. The, the toll is almost incalculable. And, and Corey, what's really heartbreaking are the, the stories upon stories of what it does, how it wears down the resources of Black wives, Black children who are trying to sustain relationships with their spouses, with their fathers behind bars. First of all, we know that, as you said, Black men are disproportionately being imprisoned, incarcerated at much higher rates than others. So we have millions of Black men whose lives are being destroyed, many of them because of government policies and laws. We're not able to, for example, obtain a college degree while in prison. So that's already making them perhaps more ineligible to a number of women on the marriage market once they're released. And of course, all kinds of housing policies that would would refuse um, housing or not allow housing for um, former inmates um, in public um, housing um, units and um, policies that, yes, we have the ban the box now, but policies that also impact the opportunities for former inmates to be gainfully employed, make it just one collateral consequence after another that just destroys the possibility for healthy, thriving, resilient Black families. So it, 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 is, it is heartbreaking to hear about um, the, the hundreds and thousands of dollars, for example, Black partners and, and wives on the outside had to spend taking collect calls. We know that some states are rolling that back. We know that there is um, quite a bit of movement now from prison abolitionists and from other advocates of prison reform, but we still have a long way to go. And the, the, the wives and children of Black incarcerated men and, and, and partners um, certainly tell a story of emotional, I would even go as far as saying emotional and financial abuse as a result of what the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration has done to Black families. Right, and so um, can you talk a little bit about state and local policies too, uh, and just give us a snapshot of what uh, they've done? Like, um, uh, uh, I know you've done some research even in the uh, 20th century and 19th century state and local laws, but is there any picture you can, you can give us before, I know we have Derek on now, uh, but I'd love to get an idea of why this is even po policies that go from the local level to the federal level. Right. I mean, one of the things that I think is is really important, and you brought it up um, when you mentioned the GI Bill, um, is that first of all, we 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 often um, have policies that are not necessarily based on the best research. We need extensive, comprehensive, great research upon which to build great policies. Um, and then implementation um, also needs to be followed through in such a way that they don't reinforce the racial wealth gap, that they don't reinforce racism and sexism and patriarchal practices. So for example, with the GI Bill, it was a great bill, as you said, but many African Americans missed out on it because of how the, the policy was implemented at the local municipal level. 
level. And so many Blacks who should have been uh, benefiting from it did not. And, and also we should, we should note that the GI Bill also afforded additional benefits for married couples, right? So if Black married couples are also um, perhaps um, um, impeding their opportunities, for example, to purchase a home and to build wealth as couples. We see those kinds of opportunities being snatched from Black people who were deserving of those opportunities at the local level. And so the same thing happens with even welfare policies. Um, when, the, when Black women began to enter um, the welfare system in massive numbers in the late 50s and early 1960s, there were federal um, policies, but the federal government worked hand in hand with local um, municipalities. And so the local governments could implement policies and practices that were very harmful to Black women and to Black men. For example, um, uh, suitable home policies, right? A man in the house policies. Um, if an able-bodied man was found in the home of a black woman who was receiving welfare benefits and they were constantly being surveilled um, during um, this time, the 1950s and 1960s, uh, he was automatically assumed to be a caretaker of that woman and her children. It was automatically assumed that he should be able to provide for all of the children in the home. So there's a very um, a, a, a patriarchal ideology behind many of these practices that does not acknowledge the fact that Black men have for centuries, many Black men have for centuries been alienated from the structural forces needed to be able to sustain themselves financially and the women and children that they love. So those policies punished black women, but they also punished black men and actually black children. Today, it's, it's, it's just as sad. I mean, I interviewed a young man um, for my book to look at how welfare policies are impacting young black families today. And it was just, it was just heart-wrenching listening to him talk about how much he works and how much the government garnishes his wages. So the time that he would like to spend with his two daughters on the weekend, he can't spend because he has to make sure he works enough hours to go into the overtime um, shift so that he can have something left over in his paycheck. So, you know, his point was that when a mother, and we know this, when a, when a mother applies for welfare benefits in most states, she has to literally sue the father yes. of her child yes. and sue him and sue him again. And so it is a very divisive policy that actually works against um, the, the support of black coupling and marriage. And, you know, he actually said to me, I, I have so many friends like me who try, who really want to provide for and support our children. And a lot of them are just saying, you know what, I give up because they're not going to take all my money. I'm just not going to let them take all my money. So the policies are punishing black women and black men at the same time. And, and, and the children. And children. And the children, and the children. I, I had that experience the, similar when I was sitting in an Uber. I ended up sitting outside of my destination just talking to the guy when he found out I was a senator, just venting to me about how much he loves his kids, how much he loves his ex-wife, but the trap, that the financial trap that he was in, it was heartbreaking listening to the life he had. 70, 80 hours a week um, he was having to put in uh, just to be able to keep rent over his own self as well as uh, do whatever and it's taking away the time that he would rather spend it was like this enemy where he couldn't spend any time with his kids so these are the traps that i'm glad that you go into i, I want to pull derek into the conversation if he's if he's on derek i was told you were on derek i don't know if you're there i'm here can you hear you me are, man you are I, <laughs> I i always see your hair coming before you man <laughs> um uh he and i i've been i've been i always try to plan it so we're not next to each other on any stage <laughs> Because it is like, you know, before and after, you know, hair today, gone tomorrow. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm really glad. I'm, I'm having this great conversation with Kilolo and, and Diane. want to pull you in for a moment, uh, really, because uh, you, my friend, uh, and, uh, and the incredible Dr. Sandy Darity uh, 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 were really the intellectual parents of baby bonds. And I've, I've really been fortunate and blessed uh, with the genius, I, I think that you all exhibited uh, that so inspired me uh, uh, to really work to turn it into real legislation 
introduced in the United States Senate, gaining traction in the United States Senate. Literally, Joe Biden, uh, I don't know if I ever told you this, Derek, during a debate, pulled me aside and started saying to that baby bonds idea. And he started telling me some of his thoughts about it. It's, it's exciting. And so maybe can you just start uh, by shifting our conversation towards baby bonds before I pull in Kilolo and Diane again. Derek, can you please just, just what are baby bonds uh, uh, um, and how do they work? Uh, can you just lay, lay it plain for us? So first, thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And, and because I came on late, I'm not going to give too many pleasantries, but just say how much I honor and respect all the people on this panel and, and grateful to be on. Uh, the question of who generated the idea, you know, in truth, Thomas Paine did. Thomas Paine is far back in 17, I believe, 78 or 76. I'm forgetting the exact date. And his uh, pamphlet, Agrarian Justice, talked about seeding every American baby with an account. He also was the first to propose Social Security. He talked about a, a basically an estate tax to provide age-old pension. And that kind of links baby bonds. Baby bonds is intended to be a bridge to build a lifetime of economic security. And you know who came up with that phrase? Tilolo Kijikasi. So, um, <laughs> and, and let me even talk about her input in the idea because Frankly, the idea was generated from a group that she would convene of experts of color from the Ford Foundation when she was in charge of this portfolio, when the task was addressing the racial wealth gap. And I always got challenged because, you know, what's, what's the obvious solution for America's unjust history? Reparations. Um, but at the time, you know, now it's starting to get some tractions. I know you're co-sponsoring HR 40, so that these all good things. Um, but at the time, people said, well, that's political pie in the sky. What else do you got, Derek? So I said, well, let's pick the dimension by which blacks and whites are so unequal. And that would, you know, if we can't use race explicitly, then wealth, because of the distribution of wealth for blacks compared to whites, there's very little over, overlap. If you want an anti-racist policy, you ground it in wealth as one, a criteria, and two, the outcome of interest. So, so that, was, that was part of the reaction. And um, it's also rooted in the notion. So let me get simple and say, a lot of our conversation is about directional emphasis. A lot of what Diane was describing is, you know, we look at a social problem and we also often say the social problem results in the resource deprivation. Baby Bonds turns it around and says, it's the resource deprivation that results in the social problems that if you want to uh, solve racial wealth gap, it's an understanding that it is wealth that begets more wealth, that the source of inequality is not behavioral. We know that black families, when you control for income, save actively as much as white families. The source of inequality is some young adults have access to some capital at a key point in their life that allows them to get into an asset that will passively appreciate over their life like being a homeowner as opposed to a renter, being an entrepreneur as opposed to a worker, or being a managerial or professional worker without the burden and albatross of debt that comes along with a college degree that puts you in that position. So baby bonds is intended so that we can truly have a society where people's efforts get rewarded. So it ensures that trust accounts are reserved for every American, not just those that are wealthy. You, 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 as always, my brother, lay it plain. I want to just say, for those people who are hearing this word baby bonds for the first time, every child born in America, as he said, race neutral, uh, gets $1,000 into an account. And then based upon the income of your parents, you get upwards of $2,000 a year placed into that interest-bearing account. We have a nation that has one out of every five children in poverty. Those people will get the full amount. The more white poor children than black poor children, but Blacks are disproportionately poor. And so that way, that, what, what that means is that all of those children who are below the poverty line getting the full amount, by the time they're 18, they would have upwards of $50,000 in an interest-bearing account to be applied to things that create that generational wealth that we're talking about. Buying a home, going to college, uh, uh, an entrepreneurial activity. And so that's what we mean when we lay it plain. But I want to ask Kilolo, by the way, brother, you are a smart man in recognizing that we are outclassed by the women we have on the panel right now uh, and their brilliance and their genius and their activism, their engagement. So Kilolo, can you just on, on your own research, what evidence 
do we, do we have on the potential impact of baby bonds and how does it compare with other major policy interventions that are focused on racial and economic uh, uh, in equal, equity? So therein lies the problem. We do not yet have evidence on the impact that baby bonds would have. What we do have is evidence on children's development accounts. So these accounts would provide, as they were tested by the Ford Foundation, provided $1,000 at birth um, during a demonstration. Um, and then parents were encouraged to contribute more to, to these accounts. What we found was that low-income households can and do save. For anybody who didn't know that already, we have the evidence they can and do save and invest in assets. The difficulty is that these, these households that have relatively low incomes do not have as much to contribute to savings. And so they cannot make up this huge difference in terms of, of wealth by saving. Moreover, the, the racial wealth gap wasn't created as a result of a lack of savings. It was created as a result of um, structural barriers that we've already talked about. So Derek's proposal and your bill build on what we know about um, the, the children's savings accounts, the children's development accounts. By increasing that initial deposit um, or the, it, in, in your bill, providing a similar deposit of 1,000, but then adding funds, public funds to that, rather than expecting parents to come up with that kind of money thereafter. The other thing that this, this um, does, this approach does, is to, it, it, you know, it, one other thing that we learned from um, children's development accounts was that even a small account resulted in a much higher rate of college going by children who had these accounts and college graduation. But what we know is that black students go into much more debt um, in order to get education. And so while these accounts may spur them on to college, it's not going to cover that cost. But having this substantial tens of thousands more um, through baby bonds than through children's development accounts, that could actually pay for a college education or, or act as a, a down payment or um, help to um, fund uh, the startup capital for for a business. But what we need is a demonstration and evaluation, hopefully with, or ideally with randomized control trials to find out what would be the impact of, of baby bonds. That, that, is, that is really excellent. Derek, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, that clearly was a shout out to foundations to come in and, and see this experiment. And, you know, and, and I want to give a lot of credit to one, you taking a chance on it, um, but also bold innovations. The, the idea of framing it as a stakeholder at birth of $1,000 for everyone, but then topping it off annually on, based on the family's position was all your office. And, and a lot of credit goes to that. Because what does that do? Really quick, I'll say that you can imagine somebody born, imagine if, um, if, if, if I marry someone who is doing their residency. So at birth, that child would look a lot less in terms of having resources than when the, my spouse becomes a, you know, a, a brain surgeon. Um, and then perhaps that child shouldn't get the full amount that they would have gotten at time zero for that account. Or vice versa, if, if I had married a brain surgeon who went bankrupt for whatever reason, um, my, perhaps that offspring or that child shouldn't be punished as a result of the parents not having economic circumstances. So I love the innovations and in working with your office and trying to get, get the policy right. So Diane, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm just so excited about your book. And, you know, I love the, the truth in it, uh, the assaults on black love, black marriage, the destruction the attacks on black families. Um, and, and amidst all of your exploration, you have a chapter 
on baby bonds. How, how do you see this all fitting together? Are, are there impacts to baby bonds that extend beyond the obvious, like the ability to buy a home, go to college and start a business? Tell me about your inclusion of that uh, in, in your book. Absolutely. Um, well, I include it in chapter five. Um, and I did that because although I'm not a policymaker, I really wanted my readers to see that if we have the will, there are viable policies that can be implemented. So I, I argue that among the most menacing obstacles Black heterosexual women face in their search for healthy love and marriage with Black men are inherited poverty and wealthlessness, America's, um, the American society's idealization of patriarchal nuclear family, and a trenchant cultural legacy of colorism and phenotypic stratification, which disproportionately impacts the low rates of marriage for Black women of medium and dark complexions relative to Black women of light complexions. However, to my surprise, I really did not expect this, did not expect this at all when I um, started the research. I concluded that the most powerful barrier of all three obstacles is inherited poverty and wealthlessness. There are few studies on what Black men really think and believe about marriage and the marriage market, but the few studies that we do have are showing that many Black men who are quite eligible for marriage are waiting for that spouse who can elevate them socioeconomically into that middle class. And the same holds true for Black women. What they're, what they're looking for is a partner that can help, um, um, uh, help them move in terms of social and economic mobility into another class rank. So the black man who's making 35,000 per year is typically looking for a spouse who's making 55,000 a year. And that spouse is not forthcoming because she's looking for a spouse who's making $75,000 a year. And we know how patriarchal, manhood has been weaponized so much against black men to exclude them from opportunities to actually earn salaries that can be rewarding and life sustaining. And so it, it became very clear to me that wealthlessness, especially because of its long legacy in America, because of its relationship to black people's involuntary presence in this country since 1619 and even before, if we count Spanish, Spanish Florida. Um, so especially because of these things, wealthlessness, wealthlessness is the key. Imagine, as Derek had already said, um, a young person, because what we know is that when people get married and stay married over the course of a lifetime, we can see two incomes growing into the wealth potential of four incomes. And so if Black people, which they do, marry much later in life than whites, if they marry at all, we can see how marriage does impact the ability to build wealth. Of course, there are studies that talk about the fact that for middle-class Black people, um, tax laws that impact marriage um, impact Black people disproportionately um, negatively relative to whites who are married. We know that. It's not that I'm saying that marriage is a way to build wealth. I'm actually saying that in building Black wealth, we will build opportunities for healthier, more resilient marriages, couples, families, and that builds a better and a stronger nation. I mean, just think about how many Black women in this COVID era are working in hospitals, they're nurses and nurses aides, and how many of them have no one to go home to. I, um, I was on a call the other day and someone was joking with another person. It was a group of friends from um, one of my previous um, academic institutions. And someone was joking and said, you're lucky. I mean, you, 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 know, you have no kids, you're, you're by yourself. And so you can really get your work done at home. You can kick up your feet. You don't have to worry about. And she said, Absolutely not. COVID has harmed me significantly. I am lonely. She said, without COVID, I could at least meet up with friends from time to time, but I have nobody mm. to actually think about what this crisis means with me. I have nobody to eat with. I have nobody to share my life with. I feel incredibly isolated at this moment. Listen, and you that all black women want to be married. Um, and I'm sure that we would probably find similar problems when we look at um, same-sex relationships. We didn't have um, statistics for same-sex marriages in the 2010 census, but I'm sure the 2020 census will bring those forward. Um, but the point is um, building black wealth will build 
Black relationships, the emotional, mental, physical health of Black people and Black couples matters to the national health of yes. America. Yes, I mean, you make me want to do another CBC panel on Black love, Black families, and just let's have some real talk about things we don't talk about for our mental health. We know Black men live long, a lot longer when they're married. Absolutely. Um, it's amazing the impact that, that it has. And I think about my two parents graduating from HBCUs uh, and my father coming from poverty, single parent, and, and, and what it, how the marriage, that partnership broke him generationally from one generation to, to me. Uh, as my dad used to tell me, boy, don't walk around this house like you hit a triple. You were born on third base uh, compared, to, to, compared to where he started. But a lot of that was because of the partnership he had with my mom. And so look, I, I, we're, we're coming to an end here. So this is why I want to do speed round, hit each of you. Because I think that the one thing uh, that, uh, that to the three of you that I've noticed is none of the problems we have in America, we can't solve. We, we actually often see the policy pathways to devastate poverty in America. Uh, I mean, there are just common sense things like a, uh, like a sp expansion of the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, not to mention other countries that do child allowances, that alone could like decimate child poverty by more than a half to two thirds. There are things we know to do uh, to address a lot of these issues. So I'm just wondering with an idea like baby bonds, what do you see are the obstacles? What has to happen for us to go from having ideas that will that are that statistically show they'll address issues to getting them done. What 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 has to happen in the next five years to implement this policy and others that will deal with racial wealth gap? And maybe I can start Kilolo with you, uh, go to Derek, and then end with Diane, and and we'll wrap this up. So, one, we need to ground this policy in a broader set of policies that will increase the impact of, of this policy. And by that, I mean, we need to eradicate uh, discrimination and inequities in K through 12 um, education so that young people who want to use their endowment for college are prepared to go to college. We need to eradicate discrimination in the labor market so that when those young people come out of college, they're not facing labor market discrimination, employment discrimination, um, occupational segregation, that would, despite their initial endowment, if they use it for education, that would put them in a place of not earning what they should in the long run. We need to eradicate discrimination in, in the housing sector so that they can buy the kinds of homes that they want to buy. Eradicate discrimination in um, the finance uh, sector so that we have access, equitable access to um, credit so that entrepreneurs have the funds that they need in addition to this endowment to go for the, for the long run and expand the businesses. Excellent, thank you, Kilolo. Derek, please. So yeah, I, I think the problems are certainly more political than they are economic. We, we know the solutions, uh, we, ha we have historical precedent, so can we build up a movement to make our government enact these policies. That's ultimately the solution. And I feel as though younger people are starting to change the discourse and narrative and ground economics in justice and morality and common humanity and in our sustainability. So they will be the change and we need to get on board. And that's the solution. We have historical precedent. We, we've seen from the New Deal, the GI Bill, that a white asset-based middle class came into fruition from public policy. We need to not forget those lessons. The problem was by design and implement, implementation, black people were excluded. Allowing a GI Bill in a Jim Crow context without federal oversight is gonna lead to disparity. Um, designing bills where you exclude agricultural and domestic workers, like originally Social Security, when 90% of black women were in that field and over half of black men were in those occupations, is by design racist. So we can change that. A couple of points I'll make and then I'll stop. I know we're moving on. Um, Diane talked a lot about gender. Our reality is not only that we have racism in our society, we have patriarchy in our society. We, even within households, there are issues of who gets to control those assets. Even within households, there are decisions about who will I leave my bequest to, male or female child. The good thing about baby bonds is that 
They're directed to the individual at birth independent of their gender. So it gives women and men some financial agency and decision-making when they become an adult. Man, uh, drop the mic, step back, and let, let, let Diane uh, pick up the mic and uh, give me her final thoughts. I'm just so excited about everything I'm hearing. I, you know, I, I think America's powerful messages of equal opportunity for all and pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps has to be dislodged in the minds of power brokers and politicians, leaders on all sides of the aisle. But we also need, as, as Derek said, to ensure that the Baby Bonds economic rights platform is widely known throughout the American population. Baby Bonds needs more champions, for sure, but its advocates must be spread across multiple arenas, political, academic, and religious bodies, even celebrities. And I would add that the commitment to seeing positive, measurable outcomes of baby bonds for Black mothers and Black women in general must be at the center of any baby bonds policy building efforts. It will be imperative to assemble experts who can ensure that baby bonds policies are designed based on comprehensive sound research and that implementation practices maximize wealth for Black girls and for Black women, which will in turn enhance the wealth of Black families. Thank you. Are you kidding me? Thank you. I, I sincerely want to get to a post-COVID era so I can invite the three of you over to my place in Newark. Rosario and I will open up a bottle of Martinelli's, uh, uh, the good, only the good stuff for you guys, and uh, we, will, we will have a deeper discussion. And maybe we'll open up a Facebook Live and let everybody uh, join, listen in to our talk because you all charge me up. You all give me a sense of possibility. And, and I just like, it, it is so obvious some of these policy issues. Uh, you all know that the, you know, the, uh, it was a Washington University study that shows children, all children, with even $500 or less in a savings account were three times more likely to go to college, four times more likely to graduate. Imagine just doing that to make, give African-American kids and all kids in this country three times better chance of going to college because we're competing, America, is competing on a, in a global context. And the country that best cultivates its genius is a country that's gonna do the best. And we, unfortunately, are creating it harder to cultivate the genius of Black Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, and therefore we're putting ourselves behind a lot of other nations who have far more progressive policies that are elevating folks up. And so what gets me really excited about this is to help other people understand that this is not just about black opportunity. This is about American opportunity because when you liberate African-Americans from debt and, and, and systematic uh, 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 poverty like you've seen or an ability to build wealth, when you liberate African-Americans wealth building possibilities, the whole economy does better. We, we know just on access to capital, that if blacks had the same access to capital to start businesses as, as whites do, we, uh, it, was, it was a McKinsey study that showed over a trillion dollars more would come to our GDP just by giving that kind of opportunity. So this is not a black issue. Uh, uh, black well-being is essential to American well-being, and we need to understand that. And what I love, Derek, when you talk about reparations is this understanding that this wasn't uh, just the, the harms were not just in the period of uh, the 400 period of slave years period of slavery. Um, the harms continued through horrific, torturous uh, uh, attacks on on black opportunity that are measurable all the way up to the conversation we were having earlier about the new Jim Crow to take uh, Michelle Alexander's description of what uh, the criminal justice system has. And so we're not just sitting here cursing the darkness, though. We are, we are providing a, a real policy possibilities to create, to change this wretched darkness uh, into a, a loving light and possibility. And when, when black families flourish, God, I mean, what that means to America. I mean, I just know that from my mom at Fisk University, struggling HBCU, the, the genius it liberated onto this world and the difference that it made. My father, North Carolina Central University, uh, what that did to liberate uh, 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 genius under this world. And what you were saying, uh, 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 Diane, so, so inspires me because when you support black families, you know, even though my parents had two questionable children, you, you liberate generations of possibility 
that weren't there before. So I'm just charged up uh, because I do see some signs of hope. When I look on the New York Times bestseller list, and I, and, and I was talking to Professor Eddie Gloud about this, uh, and you see all, all these books that are, that are laying it plain about the, the dark past that we rarely shed a light to. Uh, when you see uh, 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 teenagers, white teenagers, giving expositions about the race in a way that even James Baldwin might be sitting up in heaven and say, look at that, that's pretty good. Uh, um, you start seeing some uh, a consciousness growing in this country, but it means nothing if we can't change that consciousness into action. People who have maybe have a faithfulness now, we know faith without works is dead. So I wanna thank you all uh, to, for everything that you continue to do, your advocacy, uh, uh, your, your, your sort of, you, each of you are catalytic converters, igniting the possibilities in, in this country. And I'm grateful that you would spend on your busy schedules, you take an hour out to spend with me and all those within the CBC who are watching. Uh, I have not uh, uh, finished, I'm only beginning uh, uh, in my, my work on these policy issues springing from your genius. And please keep feeding me ideas because you make me a much more effective senator every single day. Uh, and I am just grateful. And I, I'm told, uh, Kilolo and Diane, I don't know if you heard this, but that, that when we pass baby bonds, that, that Derek has said he will, in honor of my leadership, shave his head. I don't know if you all heard that. I, I'm pretty sure that was a commitment made. Uh, so this is something we all have to look forward to. Two bold, bald brothers standing together at the signing of that bill. Who knows who's gonna sign it, CBC's Foundation nonpartisan, but maybe it'll be Joe Biden. I don't know, uh, but we'll see what happens. All right. Well, as an economist, I got to exploit my assets. <laughs> <laughs> I know you. I know you give up the hair for economic justice. <laughs> yeah. you, you make that sacrifice for your people. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. God bless you. Keep you. God bless all of us in our nation as well. Thank you.